these new perovskite-based solar cells. We've been hearing a lot about it, particularly on, on YouTube and social media. There's a lot of buzz. Um, because it's a thin film, it by nature doesn't need as much material to effectively absorb the sunlight. So like one one hundredth of the material that you would need for silicon. But in terms of performance and efficiency, how do they compare with sort of the, the, the mainstream solar panels of today? All right. Welcome back to the Solar Surge podcast. Uh, if you're new to the Solar Surge podcast, on this program, we meet with the top business leaders and the top thought leaders in the solar and energy storage space. And in today's episode, I'm joined by Danielle Merfeld. She's the chief technology officer at QCells. Of course, QCell is the top U.S. solar panel manufacturer, and we're going to be talking all about the new perovskite-based solar cells. So, Danielle, it's really great to see you. Welcome to the Solar Surge podcast. Thanks for having me, Joe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, a lot of the audience has been asking us to cover this topic, and I'm glad that you were able to make yourself available so that we can learn more about these new perovskite-based solar cells. We've been hearing a lot about it, particularly on, on YouTube and social media. There's a lot of buzz going on about this, this new perovskite technology and what this means. So for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, can you tell what, what is a perovskite solar cell and how is it different than a traditional, a traditional solar cell? Sure. And I'll just start by saying the buzz around perovskite is really because of one fundamental thing. It is the first um, big rival for silicon in terms of a solar material or technology that could potentially be lower cost and higher efficiency. So it's kind of a big deal in the solar space. Um, but you, you asked me to compare it to conventional silicon. So let's start with the silicon. I think all of your viewers know silicon has been sort of the dominant material in solar for like the 70 years solar has been around. Sure. But it continues yeah. to improve. We see benefits of improvement in silicon all the time. But it's bumping up against that theoretical limit of about 29, 30% efficiency. Um, silicon is really plentiful, but it requires a really high energy intensive process to form the single crystals into pools, which we slice into wafers, make into cells. Um, and then lastly, silicon, while it's dominant material for PV, it's not really actually that great of a solar absorber. You need, you know, hundreds of a hundred microns, at least of thickness of the material to absorb enough sunlight for it to be impactful as a power converter. In contrast, perovskite material, which is a thin film, it's kind of the new kid on the block, but it's got all this promise. Um, because it's a thin film, it by nature doesn't need as much material to effectively absorb the sunlight. So like one one hundredth of the material that you would need for silicon. Um, and the name perovskite is really not the name of the material. It's actually the name of the, of the crystal structure. The material is a metal halide, most typically. But these are also pretty plentiful materials, and they don't require this really high energy intensive step. So there's no single crystal pulling, for example, that's part of this. Um, the other big difference between silicon and perovskite material is that you can modify the silicon, the perovskite material to tailor its absorption of various portions of the spectrum. It's got at least three elements in it, being a metal halide. So unlike silicon or even cadmium telluride, another thin film material, you can't really tailor its band gap or its absorption range. Um, and when you can do that, which you can with perovskites, it lets you stack different layers on top of each other and you can selectively absorb different parts of the spectrum. And I mentioned earlier that silicon is bumping up against that limit of what it can efficiently um, uh, make in terms of power conversion is close to 30%. Um, when you can stack and you have a tandem device, now your limit is closer to 45%. And this means if you can stack perovskite on perovskite or even on conventional crystal and silicon, now you've got this much higher efficiency headroom to go after. And this is what's making people take notice, um, especially as if they're building on the incredible stability and high efficiency of conventional silicon on the bottom part. You've got this semi-transparent perovskite layer, really stable bottom cell that's made from silicon. And um, this is what is giving everyone the hope of this promise of a new type of solar for the future. Wow. Okay. Well, it, it makes sense. I mean, I, I know that, you know, people sometimes surprised that a, that a, a so-called high efficiency solar panel today may only be 23%, 24% efficient. Um, in terms of performance, how do the perovskite based solar panels, and I guess it's, it's a combination of perovskite thin film with 
crystalline silicon, but in terms of performance and efficiency, how do they compare with sort of the, the, the mainstream solar panels of today, like the, like the Qtron 430, for example? Yeah, well, so let's talk about cells versus panels. If we talk about the cells, today there's been demonstrations in the lab of silicon cells at 27%, but most commercial cells are between 23 and 24, the best are 25 up to almost 26%. And modules are a couple percent lower than that. So there's a difference between the cell efficiency and the module efficiency. Um, most of the perovskite um, technology um, sort of metrics are around the cell level still, because there's just not enough different groups making modules from them. But for example, the, mod the cell level perovskite um, records right now, there's I think 34% is the cell efficiency for perovskite, but those are quite small, like one centimeter squared and mostly smaller. Um, whereas we've, we've made um, M10 form factor, which is pretty significant, typical um, commercial scale solar size. We've made our M10 perovskite silicon tandems with efficiencies that are regularly north of 29%. So we've got a pretty manufacturable process. Uh, we pulled one of these wafers off the line and had it certified at Fraunhofer ESA at 28.6% at the end of last year, which is the record, it's the world record for you know, commercial scale solar tandem cells, but it might be the only M10 cell that's perovskite silicon as well. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, this is all exciting. I mean, things continue to get better. Now, in terms of pricing, I'm, I'm curious, you know, uh, having to use this additional material, what, what, what's the actual mineral, mineral or material that, that's used to make these new cells? You mentioned it so, earlier. Yeah, it's a metal halide, which um, metal halide, the, way to think, okay. the most common one is a methyl ammonium lead trihalide. And then the halogen is either iodine, bromide, or chloride. So it's a bunch of different elements, but they're not expensive. They're easy to access. They're not going to add a lot of cost. But the process of adding perovskite on top of conventional silicon does add some cost. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm curious. I know QCells has made a large investment in onshoring the, the, the solar supply chain. In fact, I had an opportunity to visit your facility that's under construction in Cartersville, Georgia, where you're going to be manufacturing solar ingots, wafers, cells, and finished solar modules all under one roof. So I know made in USA and domestic content is something that's important to Q-cells. With these new, these new materials and elements required for this, this the new perovskite-based uh, thin film solar modules, uh, will that still be sort of a, a made in USA product and all of those materials be sourced affordably here in the States? Yeah, there's no, there's no reason why the materials can't be sourced affordably in the U.S. Um, they already are found in products in the U.S. today. Um, and as you mentioned, our priority is the U.S. market. So we're developing as much in-country capability as possible. So our Cartersville facility is kind of the premier um, all under one roof silicon based capability. And so looking forward to uh, production of perovskite tandems in the future just gives us um, more headroom to build on this foundation that we've, that we've been investing in in the U.S. Okay. Now, I know you can't give me specific pricing, but I'm sure people out there are going to ask. I mean, in terms of the cost of like the finished solar module with the perovskite-based thin film on, you know, on top of traditional silicon, you know, on a price per watt basis, how is this going to compare to a, a silicon only based module that, that we might be more familiar with today, like like the Qtron, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you mentioned, we're not um, we don't we're not offering these products for sale yet. So I don't have the pricing information. And if I did, as you suggested, I wouldn't be able to share it likely. But the expectation when we launch any new um, any new product is that's going to be competitive with what it's replacing. So this would be essentially competitive with conventional silicon based or Qtron on a dollar per watt basis. So as I mentioned earlier, each panel is going to cost a little more to make than the conventional silicon junction silicon panel by itself, but the additional cost is more than balanced by the additional power. So the dollars per watt basis can be probably the same. The, the most interesting part is that when you have these more power dense panels, don't forget there's this big savings in balance of plant due to the need for less racking, less cables, less land. And that's where we see the big opportunity for value um, from these new modules. Makes sense. And, and do you see these primarily being deployed in commercial settings or would these be in, in residential settings as well? Yeah, well, it, generally there is a lot more value for land constrained solar applications at the residential and commercial level versus utility. But between the two, it would depend on, I would say, probably the market um, drivers for you know, putting in a new technology, would we want this to be dispersed across a bunch of residences or a, a few big projects 
with uh, customers or partners at the commercial scale. I would vote on commercial scale, but it kind of depends on what our growth strategy is for deploying these. It's hard to say at this point, but it likely will be space constrained applications. That makes sense. That makes sense. Now, Danielle, as you know, the, the, the solar space, particularly the storage space, has gotten particularly competitive over the past couple of months with a lot of new entrants. Uh, are any of your competitors close to bringing a similar product to market? Uh, and if so, what is, what is your strategy to keep Q-cells ahead of the pack? Yeah, so as you, as you suggested, there are, a lot of peop- there are a lot of groups, a lot of competitors developing a variety of approaches to not all the same way. Um, to bring perovskite tandem to market, but none of them are offering competitive products at commercial scale yet. Um, in fact, most of the industry that's working in this space is very focused on proving out the long-term reliability for these new products because they have this famously fickle nature from their early days of being developed that had very fast degradation modes. And so while we've solved a lot of those initial challenges, any new technology really has to be fundamentally rooted in experimental and um, quantitative uh, studies to show that it's going to last for this warranty of 25 to 30 years. But what we're doing to stay ahead, and we have our, our strategy is really rooted in the scope and scale of our effort. So we have end-to-end capabilities from design, development, testing um, throughout the whole system. We're the largest silicon PV player in the Western Hemisphere. So this provides us this really great foundation and, frankly, a complete control of that bottom cell. We aren't just putting a perovskite layer on someone's cell. We're putting it on our own specially designed cell so we can design them together to work together as a unit, the bottom and top cell. And there's a lot of interactions between those two systems that we have to consider. Another aspect of our strategy to stay competitive is that we're also working at scale. I mentioned our pilot line is using M10 cell format. We're also working at a volume of high enough so that we can deliver statistics, which are really crucial for learning. Um, We also have development at the module level. So not only are we making the top and bottom cell, we're also developing technology at the module level because these are quite different from conventional modules. So there's new innovation and it's really critical, especially for assessing the long-term product value, how the module, the product itself is developed. And then our not so secret weapon in terms of our competitiveness is that we're utilizing, we're tapped into a really strong research consortium Um, with development partners across Europe and Asia and in the U.S., including some of the world's top research institutes and industrial equipment providers in the solar arena. So at this point, we've we've sort of achieved the necessary performance demonstration at scale, and now we're focusing on um, ensuring 25 or more years of product reliability um, while we have this manufacturing-friendly and sort of gigawatt-scale supplier development um, on our platform. Okay, that makes sense. And it, I guess in, in terms of the, f- the finished product, right, the finished solar module that's available for sale, let's say for, for a solar installer, are, are, we, are we expecting similar operating voltages and temperatures as what installers are typically used to seeing today? Yes. In fact, that's kind of our, our strategy as well, is we want this product to be as similar to our conventional products as possible so that it can be adopted as easily and really have less friction in the system of point of sale. So as much as we can lean on the infrastructure that we have today in terms of typical size, scale, framing, weights, um, current voltage, we will do that. And, you know, ultimately, as we're looking at residential and commercial rooftop um, applications, we're likely to have um, um, module level power um, um, on the back. So we'll have micro inverters. So this will be a pretty plug and play kind of solution for our customers. That's great. That's great. And I guess, you know, what, what, if anything, can you share with us about when do you think a, a finished, a finished product would be available for sale in, in commercial quantities and wholesale quantities? Yeah, it's hard to say. There's a big debate in the company about when we should do this. We've certainly got the opportunity to put our products out in the field first, and that's going to be um, really ultimately going to be down to how much risk do we want to take? Do we want one or two years of field studies behind us before we d- deploy these to our markets? Can we deploy them in a low cost or low risk way with favored customers or partners? Um, so I can't really give you the answer on what year we'll deploy these, but I would expect it's in the next two to th- three or four years. That's cool. Well, I know the, the the community and certainly the community online is very excited about the the, the potential of this new technology, you know, potentially close to double the, the cell efficiency of what we're, what we're used to seeing with silicon only. Uh, and of course, if we can, we can still take advantage of similar pricing and domestic content and all of that, it just makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, Danielle, last question for you. Where do you see this technology going as you look further out into the future? Yeah, well, I think the holy grail for solar is to move from this perovskite silicon tandem device to perovskite only. So multi-junction tandems. So I think we, we know we have to push the limits of efficiency, but if we could completely eliminate that high energy intensive silicon component, that would be great. We could you know, even see triple junction tandems that play um, with a power conversion limit, theoretical limit closer to 50%. Um, but we have a long way to go before proving that out. And, you know, silicon as, as the dominant solar um, material today is still expected to be in our energy mix for some time. I just think the, um, the world's going to benefit from a really highly efficient, low cost alternative that leads to um, a reduction in our energy intensity, material use and land use overall. It's, when you think about the projections for how much solar will be um, impactful to our energy ecosystem, the more efficient, the less land, the more capability and the lower cost it can be, the better. So everyone's pulling in the same direction when it comes to the future of solar, I believe. Yeah, no, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for over 12 years now, and just to see how the technology has matured just in the last five years is pretty astounding. And especially with, with the advances that are happening on the energy storage side as well, you know, becoming energy independent at, at a household level, at a business level, I think has never been more within reach than it is today. Yeah. Um, well, Danielle, anything else that the audience should know about Q-cells or what they're doing with perovskite technology? Well, I just think, um, like many companies, we're always trying to push the envelope. And um, ultimately, we want the right partners, we want the right employees, and we love our customers to be a part of that journey with us. So we are growing, we're hiring great talent. If there's anyone interested in this space, they should seek us out. Sounds good. Well, folks, this has been a discussion with Danielle Murfo. She's the chief technology officer at QCells, uh, of course, the U.S. number one solar panel manufacturer. Uh, and folks, that, that's why we do the programs like this, is to make sure that uh, you stay up to date with all the latest solar industry and technology information. But uh, that pretty much does it for today's episode. Danielle, I thank you again for making yourself available and for spending some time with the Solar Surge audience today. My pleasure, Joe. Thanks for having me on. You got it. Well, that does it for this episode. I thank you all for spending some more time on the Solar Surge channel. And as always, I'm Joe Ordia here, encouraging you to get prepared and be empowered. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.